Software Engineering Radio Episode 63, a pattern language for distributed systems. Welcome everybody to a new episode of Software Engineering Radio. Um, in this episode, we are going to talk with Kathleen Henney and Frank Bushman about uh, basically about mostly about POSA 4, the new volume in the POSA series. Um, we'll see later what it contains. Um, before we actually get started, I would just briefly like to thank the organizers of the OOP conference for, for providing us this room here, uh, which is really nicely quiet. So thanks to Six Data Com, Com and uh, Wolfgang Reuter for uh, giving us this this room here. Um, so before we get started with the content. I think you both should introduce yourself so people know who you are. So uh, who wants to start? Yeah, I'm Frank Bushman. I'm working for Siemens Corporate Technology, uh, working on software architecture there, specifically on distributed systems. And one of my key areas of expertise is patterns and pattern languages. I'm Kevin Henney. I'm an independent consultant. I'm based in the UK. Uh, my company is Kerberlan. Which stands for? Curly Bracket Languages. Okay. Um, which covers a multitude of sins, uh, including uh, my areas of interest and expertise, which uh, include programming languages, um, development process, software architecture, uh, with a particular view to talking about um, patterns at all levels. Okay, so um, people might have read that somewhere that, that POSA 4 and 5 are, have come out, or it actually it depends on when we're going to broadcast this episode. <laughs> so um, can you give us a brief overview of what POSA 4 and 5 contain and... Um why you wrote this book, what's the goal? Um, POSA 4 is, uh, covers a broad um, area. It presents a uh, pattern language for distributed computing. The goal here is really to uh, give architects and um, developers an overview of the, so the language of design behind um, modern large-scale distributed systems. The uh, work, in essence, brings together um, uh, pretty much the previous 10 years of POSA uh, work. Uh, in POSA 1, uh, the beginning started off with uh, key considerations such as broker, and since then uh, many people, including yourself, have refined and expanded on that work. POSA 2 gave us a much stronger vocabulary for dealing with um, the middleware infrastructure uh, mm -hmm. with a focus on concurrency and networking. Uh, POSA 3 gave us a focus on resource management, and each one of these offers different aspects. POSA 4 um, tries to bring this and the work of others, uh, whether it be the Gang of Four, whether it's Martin Fowler's Patterns for Enterprise Application Architecture, um, and numerous other works, tries to bring them together uh, with a total of 114 patterns um, connected to give us a, a language for talking about the architecture of distributed computing systems, not just distributed object computing, but mm. uh, pretty much all modern forms of um, uh, demonstrated and practical uh, distributed systems. So it's a, mostly a collection of existing patterns wrapped in a nice language and supplied with examples and this kind of stuff. That's correct, yeah. We um, took the view that there is a great deal of literature that goes into detail. So, for example, in POSA 2, uh, each of the patterns typically hits 20 to 30 pages, yeah. provides you with detail on everything, provides you with code-level examples, and so on. It provides you with the detail when you care and when you need it. Yeah, right. It, <laughs> and so, you know, th this is good. If you, if you are, uh, when you need that focus, it's good to have it, but sometimes you need to zoom, zoom out yep. and get the big picture. And the big picture cannot be provided in this form. It's just going to be um, difficult for people. Yes. So what you'll find in POSA 4 is that the patterns, we have focused them down to two or three pages a piece, so it's an order of magnitude um, less. We've yep. Uh, taken that, uh, we have um, focused them with respect to distributed computing. So many patterns, in re-documenting these patterns, it's been a great challenge to connect them together. Right. It's not just a rewriting. It's, it's not a just a rewriting. Yeah, it's a refocusing. So therefore, the generality of some patterns, what you'll find is that some of the general cases where they apply are actually omitted um, mm. for the simple reason we're saying, okay, this is about this pattern in the context of distributed computing. Yeah. It is not about solving certain other kinds of problems. We recognize that. We provide a full set of references. Yeah. Um, but we are focused on this one goal, which helps us to keep the pattern length uh, uh, sort of short. Yeah. Um, but they're not sort of superficial abstracts. These yeah. actually go into quite some depth. We bind it together 
um, with an overview of each of the um, uh, categories of patents. We have a number of categories that we've formed for them. We'll talk about these we'll talk in a minute. About, yeah. <coughs> and um, we uh, preview this with a um, discussion of the concepts behind um, the patents, the patent language, and obviously distributed systems, bind it together with um, a narrative example that uh, draws on a, a good majority of the patents mm. and shows them in practice so that people can actually see how uh, we thread through and create a sequence of it mm. and then follow uh, the patents themselves. Okay, Frank, POSA 5. Yeah, POSA 5 was actually intended to be another part of POSA 4, But it was one big book, the Bible. Originally, POSA 4 and <laughs> POSA 5 were supposed to be a single volume in the POSA series, but our peer reviewers about a year ago strongly suggested to think about splitting it into two volumes yeah. um, just for addressing their target audience much, much better. And, and much, to much make sure it's not 900 pages. Right. So in total, POSA 4 and POSA 5 are about 900 pages. Yeah, that's pages. why I'm saying it. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it's so it's good to have them split it into two volumes. Um, POSA 5 is about conceptual foundations of patterns. Since the early days, uh, 1992 to 1994, um, and a little later with Cope's um, white book on software patterns, um, Little material, little art, only a few articles were published about the concept of patterns. Much of what is in the heads of developers and people about patterns is actually um, conceptual work from the early days of the community. Mm -hmm. However, um, now we know much more about patterns. Uh, time didn't stand still. Yeah. 2000 and we have 2007 now. So the goal of POSA 5 is to revisit the early uh, conceptual work, discuss it with the hindsight of today, um, extend it and adjust it according to what we know now, and also to complete it with um, other conceptual knowledge that we um, learned and collected over the years. So it started out by revisiting the concept of a standalone pattern based on, on the Gang of Four and POSA 1 work Uh, and others, and then develops further concept like um, complementary patterns where multiple patterns address the same general problem, yep. but yep. according to different forces, they provide different solutions. So yep. the solution space is broader. We are visiting the concept of um, pattern complements where uh, a, s a specific set of patterns recurs over and over again in a very specific arrangement to resolve a larger problem that cannot be addressed by uh, a single pattern alone. Mm. Um, we then go into uh, pattern stories where we discuss how a narrative form of a, a bunch of patterns um, helped or informs the design of a specific system. Mm -hmm. And then go into pattern sequences, which is a concept that was let's say it is quite old it was introduced by uh, um, uh, Christoph Alexander but the pattern community actually didn't pay much attention to it until recently mm -hmm. so we explore pattern sequences which abstract the story from the story so it's the naked order of the patterns and that gives you some advice and then go into pattern languages mm -hmm. uh, another topic of the book is that we address uh, pattern collections, various forms of organizing patterns from catalogs uh, to languages. Mm -hmm. uh, and we also discuss different views on patterns, such as the semiotics view uh, introduced by James Noble uh, four years ago, mm -hmm. or a problem frame view, which was quite new um, until we addressed it. Now there are uh, some other folks also um, investigating on this uh, concept, on this view. So it's more a conceptual overview. It's a conceptual closure, actu closure actually, of the mm -hmm. POSA series. So is it, is it fair to say that uh, POSA 4 is probably more intended for the practitioner and uh, POSA 5 more for the patterns, patterns community or maybe, the, you know, the f philosopher? Or is it uh, Yes and no. Um, from the one perspective, yes, but from the other perspective, specifically with respect to pattern sequences, complementary patterns, and also pattern languages, there's a whole of 
methodological methodological advice so yeah. how mm-hmm. to use a language mm. okay uh, what is the process embedded there mm. um, what can i expect from a language from what can i expect from a sequence and what yeah. where doesn't it help me another difference between the two uh, books is they are they are close in the sense they were originally going to be one yeah. volume and if you like poser 4 was originally intended to be a worked example of the principles and ideas that we had worked mm-hmm. we, very, we always kept an eye on the practice so when we separated the two parts um, it was uh, the principles are still there but we've had to d- only discuss them briefly Poser mm-hmm. 5 allows people to really understand a lot mm-hmm. more of the thinking mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. the history behind it so mm-hmm. Um, in extracting what became a very large worked example, yeah. um, uh, comparable in length to Poser 2, um, we elaborated and expanded what is now Poser 5 with a number of shorter worked examples. Mm-hmm. It, is, uh, it is very practically focused. It is not um, simply um, a presentation of theory. It is, uh, and let's see how this applies. We're very, yeah. very yeah. Uh, keen to demonstrate that. We pick as many examples as seems appropriate Um, at each time. We try and demonstrate through example uh, the relevant parts of a pattern, the weaknesses or strengths of particular styles um, and the various trade-offs um, the styles of design that are of interest, and, and we draw on all of these. So although it is fair to say that um, certainly if one is interested in the more philosophical aspects, then Poser 5 will have uh, be more rewarding. Uh, Poser 5 also offers something for people who would not consider themselves... Um, uh, philosophers of patterns uh, or even members of the patterns community mm. but where they want to go beyond um, uh, they've read maybe two or three patterns books they like to know a little more about the thinking and the mm. implicit processes yeah, behind yeah. it um, but they would still consider both their feet firmly in the world of um, practice mm-hmm. and POSA 5 contains real code mm-hmm. so it's oh, not okay. just theory Okay, um, but one point though um, asking what is the value or the contribution mm-hmm. of the audience mm-hmm. in fact the entire series is worth more than the sum of its parts because of course Posa 1 through Posa 3 together with other uh, pattern books that describe patterns in in detail in code level detail yeah. um, they provide the groundwork uh, Posa 4 connects them from the perspective of distributed systems yeah, or, or the other way Posa around 5 provides the methodology yeah yeah, yeah. so people so, may read posa four and, and and need to use some of the patterns and yes. then they can go back to posa one two and other books yes. and pattern series and everywhere else and to see posa uh, five provides them with the conceptual framework how of to how, use them of how everything fits together mm. okay so um in this discussion we however still want to like focus on on posa four and, and look at these patterns for building distributed systems and um, we've done discussions of pattern works before in the podcast and one i think successful approach uh, is to really look at the different sections because this outlines the process and the different concerns of building a distributed system and and then picking two or three of the patterns or maybe four whatever uh, of the, the patterns in that section and therefore show like more or less an example through the through the whole thing so um i think we should get started and um the first um, chapter in this uh, language section of the book is called From Mud to Structure. So I guess this covers the basic architectural styles. Yes. Um, if you start building an application, whether distributed or not, you need to have an idea of what the system is all about. I mean, the fact that it is distributed is a challenge, but nevertheless, you need a notion and an understanding what you want to build. And um, the patterns in the chapter from mud to structure help you to partition the big ball of requirements you have (laughs) into tangible parts that help you building your system. So it's the first step of transforming requirement into software structure. These requirements are more technical requirements and not necessarily domain or functional requirements? Uh, it can be a mixture of both. For instance, we start, the first pattern is domain oh, model, yeah. mm-hmm. and that focuses purely on understanding your domain. If right. you have no idea of what your system should do and what the domain is and what your domain abstractions are, what the workflows in your domain mm. are, and you, um, well, you can't build a proper system. Yeah. And then there are other patterns like uh, layers, model view controller, or microkernel, or reflection, 
that address technical concerns of partitioning or providing a fundamental baseline right. architecture, where other patterns like pipes and filters, shared repository, or blackboard address certain style of computation, uh, mm -hmm. processing data streams, like and data. And so this filter, is more yeah. domain related. Mm -hmm. So it's a mixture of both, but actually it starts from the domain right. and then addresses key technical aspects and key uh, properties of computation in mm -hmm. that domain. Mm -hmm. With the requirements, uh, as, as uh, is the case with many systems, the requirements tend to come undifferentiated. Right. And it's, yes. it's, it tends to be very tempting for somebody who's technically focused to sort of run off and say, right, we're going to build a distributed system. Somebody go and find out what people want, actually want to run over it. Um, you know, what's the domain? Well, we'll do that second. Um, and it is, although we may be very strongly technically focused in a lot of the detail in the book, it has to be anchored in some understanding of the problem, and we, we work from that. So there is a reason, it's not just a historical reason to, for calling this from mud to structure, echoing uh, uh, the equivalent section in Poser 1. It really yeah. is, there is a sense of something to be built, and we want to separate, mm -hmm. and we want to provide ourselves importantly with the partitioning, and this is the, the course partitioning and sort of style decisions yeah. that we take, we want to be able to give ourselves the opportunity to think about things separately. And that's mm. one of the key ideas is, okay, maybe we do not have the level of understanding of the domain, or the domain may be fluid, um, but the technology may be mature. On the other hand, the technology and our application of it may be very fluid, yeah. and the domain may Stable. be understood, and so on. Yeah. We would like the opportunity to keep these worlds um, uh, sort of no more intertwined than necessary, but mm -hmm. with a good understanding of each. They, they each belong somewhere. So so that mm -hmm. is why the, uh, the, the patent language, we, we spent some time arriving at the root pattern being domain model, um, and uh, that was the most satisfying and stable thing. And when we reflected mm -hmm. on how we actually approached systems building, um, this also matched our experience very well. Yeah. And this domain model, model stuff is, so if you talk about references to other work, then this is obviously Eric Evans' stuff, right? It relates to Eric Evans' work. It also relates to uh, Martin Fowler's um, uh, work, and the idea is that of the stuff of the system. Uh, what, what is the thing that we are going to build this for? Um, it is not a system that is concerned with sockets and IP addresses, yes. um, unless you're actually writing a network management yes. system. <laughs> then that is, of course, your domain. But um, there is that notion of there is some domain, there is a vocabulary, there are ideas, mm -hmm. and there is um, uh, there, somebody cares about something. And so within that space, we um, there are many... Th Many ideas we can bring to bear. We can talk about uh, sort of domain-driven design as yeah. a technique. We can look back at um, uh, domain analysis approaches, um, uh, feature-oriented domain analysis. Yeah, meta models. Yeah, uh, we can uh, uh, differentiate things using feature modeling and commonality variability analysis yeah. and so on. We're not dictating and describing one style for partitioning the domain. Uh, we are saying that it needs to be done and, and we cite appropriate works. And then we continue into the other architectural considerations. Yeah, domain uh, model also then not only refers to the other patterns that we present in the chapter and the uh, domain-driven design and other works, but this is also an entry point for us to reference all the um, domain-specific patterns documented mm -hmm. so far, such as Martin Fowler's, Fowler's analysis patterns right. for healthcare and uh, corporate finance and all the telecom patterns documented. Uh, throughout the Prop D series, so it's an uh, it's the root pattern of the language, and uh, we reference the relevant relevant work to identify a do uh, define a domain model. Um, it's a starting point uh, for our for the pattern patterns in our language, and also references all the domain specific patterns. Okay, so then uh, the next step then really is technical. Um, it's called distribution infrastructure and, and deals obviously with the nuts and bolts of building a scalable, technically sound distributed system, right? Yes. So the second sec chapter is about the core patterns that help you to connect distributed components. Yeah. Um, originally, we started with broker, which is much the remote method invocation style. Yeah. Um, we got a um, suggestion from Doug Lee that this is Corbo style only. Yeah. So that is true. So we now have messaging and we have 
uh, publish, subscribe as core infrastructures as well. Uh, speaking of messaging, that is the entry point into Gregor Hoppe's and Bobby Wolf's work. So yep. we connect that book as well. Uh, we don't repeat each of the patterns in there, but just the Some core, the, the the messaging, which is yeah. the root, and the key patterns referenced by messaging. Right, and if, if you listeners uh, look back at our interview with Gregor Hoppe, which uh, just wanted to point out that not just the, the book is organized in a way that referenced previous work, also the podcast is organized in a way that this interview can reference previous interview episodes and uh, we talked about these different sections in uh, Gregor's book and we talked about these entry patterns to those separate sections and exactly those entry patterns are now referenced here in this like bigger uh, more encompassing pattern language so right. this is really cool right so we have messaging message channel message endpoint message translator and message router exactly. included in our language yeah. described on two to three pages and in these patterns, we reference the other patterns as they are referenced in Gregor's book. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So yeah. it, it, it really uh, points into his pattern language. And that broadens, of course, the scope of the language of the 114 patterns that we describe. Yeah. And in to by this um, transitive references, we yes. reach about 300 different patterns. Yeah. Yeah, this is cool. So one of the um, other points to pick up on is uh, we... In trying to write this book, we wanted to write a pattern language for distributed computing, not simply a pattern language for uh, distributed object RPC-style yes, yes, com yes, yes. uh, computing. That was, um, that was quite valuable. Um, so in embracing that, we are looking at uh, proven architectures, many with different characteristics. Uh, but we find that in this distribution infrastructure chapter, uh, we are looking at the plumbing, the, the, the key plumbing that you're going to see from the outside, and then we decompose from there. And there are many commonalities the next level down. Mm. But we also did some pattern refactoring. Broker is a good example. Um, broker is originally described in POSA 1, and mm -hmm. it has a very specific structure. Over time, we learned that this structure might not be the... Um, the most, the most general one? The most ideal one yeah. to describe the ingredients of broker. And the remoting patterns book was it actually that disassembled and reassembled broker and yeah. came up with a new structure. And yeah. that is also reflected in our language. So wherever we identified patterns that need refactoring or decomposition and uh, reassembly, well, we did it. So... Mm -hmm. Even those patterns that are well-known and well-documented mm. were carefully revisited yep. to address the latest knowledge in what patterns are documented, to watch other patterns they could refer. And um, Broker, for instance, didn't just uh, reflect the structure uh, outlined in the remoting patterns. We also introduced some of the security aspects yep. that are covered in the security patterns book. Yep. So, so it's yep. even more. Yep. And um, we actually have a discussion on this evolution in POSA 5 using Broker mm -hmm. as an example mm -hmm. that from the days of POSA 1 there are four or five different versions yep. and the latest and greatest version of course is in POSA 4. <laughs> yeah, and so, so in the same sense as you're uh, referencing uh, Gregor and Bobby's stuff, um, in the same sense you also referenced the remoting pattern stuff which yes. we also covered in the previous episode on the podcast, so yes. again you can go back and look at the details. And we cover security pattern stuff which might be a future episode. Certainly, yes, it's on, <laughs> it's, it's on the list. <laughs> So basically what you're saying is there are those two different styles, messaging and remote procedure call. And publish, subscribe. And publish, subscribe. How is that different from messaging? It's an even more loose coupling. Okay, so it's messaging one to many, more or less. I can dynamically register and... With messaging, <laughs> with messaging you care who you're talking to. Um, it is very much as in okay. messaging in the form of SMS. You mm. are, um, uh, okay, and the other one so, is the megaphone. Yeah. So the idea of, of publish subscribe, it, although they share many features in common, yeah. um, at one level the intent is actually slightly different. I want asynchronous end-to-end uh, -end communication with messaging. With publish subscribe, we can actually have multiple publishers and multiple subscribers mm. um, who do not care about each other's identity. Mm -hmm. um, it is a very, very different style at that level. And mm. there are other quality of service concerns that come in that simply don't fit with messaging. But you didn't cover streaming, right? Because that could be considered another form of distributed systems. Or how does that fit in? We had a discussion about this. Yeah, I hope so. And <laughs> we 
I mean, pipes and filters is about streaming. But it's not about transporting a stream over a distribution network, keeping quality of service and stuff. No, no. Right. It's not um, streaming as you discuss it in the remoting patterns book. Um, but we consider um, there's a discussion that we had because pipes and filters is also described in the messaging uh, patterns by Gregor and Bobby. Yeah. Um, and we consider this uh, pipes and filters more as a way to organize applications rather than the fundamental style of communication. Mm -hmm. And in between the filters, there is a pipe that uses messaging. Yes. So we had a discussion, what are the fundamental style of communication? And we have this remote method invocation mm -hmm. where you are depend on the uh, point to is point to point communication yeah. depending on the interfaces of the components you invoke. Uh, messaging is you have a point to point communication but are independent of functional uh, interfaces yeah. of your of the component. Except uh, that you have to agree on the message structure. So well. Uh, It is in the message format. Yes. But it's a loser coupling. Yeah, of course. And uh, eventing or publish subscribe is then an even loser coupling yeah. because you not even care for the identity. Right. That were the fundamental styles. Yes, streaming... Um, is an application of that. Is an application of that. Yeah. Because if you look into the messaging patterns, they actually discuss uh, message sequencing to form streams. Mm -hmm. So in some sense... Uh, the message pattern that we also have in our book uh, is an entry point to 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 compose message streams, which then can be used to transmit data streams yeah. with quality of service from filter to filter yeah. through a yeah. pipe. So yeah. it is covered, um, but we don't consider it as a fundamental style of communication. Okay. Next section is um, even more detailed or more technical. So after discussing the general uh, style of remote communication and distribution, um, the next one uh, deals with event demultiplexing and dispatching. This sounds to me an awful bit like um, uh, POSA 2, right? Curiously enough, yes, it does. Um, the two dominant patterns in there, uh, reactor and proactor, you can say, um, and Those are those provide the the roots. Uh, we are receiving uh, messages. These messages are, uh, in this sense, this is we refer to these from the point of view of events. Um, how do we mm -hmm. handle this? These are coming in from wherever. They need to go somewhere. These capture the different styles and the different concerns. Following on from that, we have acceptor, connector, and asynchronous completion token. Mm -hmm. um, With this uh, aspect, we are now definitely within the middleware as opposed to uh, within, right. the, within the code. We're not out on the network anymore. Yes. Um, and so the concerns, the chapter is, very, is, is relatively short but very focused. Um, perhaps the greatest challenge here is, as you say, this sounds an awful lot like POSA 2. And we just said POSA 2 embraces um, uh, some phenomenal detail and reactor and proactor yes. <laughs> in POSA 2 take yeah. up a lot of real estate. Yeah, and by the way, we discussed some of that in, in the interview with Doug Schmidt a while ago. So again, we can connect to a previous episode. So uh, our challenge here was to represent um, faithfully uh, the, the intent and offer people sufficient sufficient detail to make reasoned decisions about stuff but without necessarily trying to cover all the same ground as poser to yeah hopefully <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. as i look at the at the table of content which we use as a kind of guide through the episode here i can see that reactor has two stars associated with it and proactor has none what are these stars about and why doesn't proactor have stars We have um, followed the, uh, as it were, the, the, the star rating that was used originally by Christopher Alexander to sort of rate a um, sort of degree of confidence or applicability of mm -hmm. a particular pattern. We are not making comments on the um, co quality of the pattern itself. Um, we, we are looking at it specifically in the context of typical distributed computing, right. how broadly applicable is okay. this pattern. Mm -hmm. And two stars mean that we have a high degree of confidence. Everybody uses that, it. Yeah, this is something you would typically want and typically find, and yep. the risks are relatively few. In other words, there are very few dark patches. If we rate something as one star, then that um, sort of adds a slightly cautionary note. Often... Um, some of the one-star patterns are in contrast to some of the two-star patterns that are in the language. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they are complementary. Um, yes, this is applicable, but um, there are sort of more edge cases where mm -hmm. this one would apply. Uh, we also have no, some no-star patterns, as you say, the proactor. proactor. 
is one of them. Um, and uh, in that sense, we, when we said reactor, we looked at react and we saw, right, this is, this is typical, this is common, this is easy to understand. Um, it, is, it is very widespread. Proactor is far more specific. It's also more challenging to implement. Yes. Um, or or a, 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 a bit more cynically, hardly anybody uses it because hardly anybody understands it. That, that goes back to the challenge. It, <laughs> yes, is, it is a more yeah. complex pattern, yeah. but that does not mean it is not applicable. It oh, no, no, reduces no. the applicability. Uh, yeah. So it is contained in the language. Right. Um, some patterns were not included in the language simply because we um, uh, either did not find them uh, appropriate. So, for example, when uh, maybe maybe later we, we, we talk about object adapters, but we mm-hmm. don't talk about class adapters. We okay. did not find a uh, scope for that. And I think our favorite um, pattern that we omitted is the only pattern that got a negative star rating when we looked at which it. Is and, a single oh, which is, of course, single Yeah, time. everybody knew that. <laughs> so it's 114, not 115 patterns. Okay. <laughs> Okay, after those technical infrastructure details of handling network events and stuff, uh, we now get one level up towards how to partition an application, more specifically about how to partition interfaces. And this is actually a relatively long topic, uh, chapter, sorry, which, which means that there's quite a bit to say about how to design interfaces, which many people would probably say, oh, what's the problem there? Yeah, uh, it's actually a quite long chapter and for good reasons because um, interface design, designing interfaces specifically for components in a distributed system is a challenge. And uh, we were surprised when we um, started out to lay out the language that we have a hole here, a white space in the language and we... It took us some months to discover it's all about interfaces and we also discovered that only a few patterns were actually described. It was somehow implicitly there in the community, but not explicitly documented. Can you maybe outline some of the challenges you have when desi- designing interfaces, especially maybe the, the, you know, the problem between the forces that tend to make the interfaces good for, from a functional purpose and the forces that drive you towards a way that makes the system scale better, and then maybe take some of the patterns in this chapter to outline how they solve these forces, these contradicting forces? Yeah, first of all, um, you need to separate interface from implementation, yeah, obviously. obviously. Yeah. Uh, otherwise, you can't uh, get access to an interface yeah. uh, f- in a remote address space. So we address that uh, as the fundamental pattern, explicit interface, how mm-hmm. to do this, because this is um, said quickly, but doing it properly is difficult. Mm-hmm. Other patterns then address um, the scope of interfaces Uh, having to um, narrow interfaces won't help much of the client. If you have to broad interfaces, you get a shopping list of methods mm. you actually don't use. And if one of the signatures changes, uh, you are affected. Your code breaks. You don't want this. So we have the notion of role-specific interfaces, yeah. um, which is expressed in the extension interface pattern. Um, then in large distributed systems, you might want to know more about a component than can then the uh, typical interfaces offer, and we offer introspection. Mm-hmm. Uh, and some clients, like uh, test frameworks, have no clue about the interfaces. You so you need a dynamic access so that yeah, you so can it's assemble used for, for scripting. Right, um, and um, then we have lots of uh, patterns that help you hiding infrastructure details because clients are not interested in oh this component is. A um, on the other side of the network or there might be load balancing or any quality of service involved I just want to use a method or a function and so we have patterns addressing that so proxy business delegate and facade are not necessarily about how the interface looks but rather about how to decouple the interface from the implementation and fr- separated from technical concerns right. like networking mm-hmm. network failure management mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, availability concerns Uh, load balancing and stuff. Behind the business delegate, for instance, a lot of things can happen. Uh, There are security proxies which hide some security stuff. Mm -hmm. So the technical concern, uh, these patterns like proxy business delegate and facade help you separating um, structural and technical concerns of the component implementation. Right. And, and batch method is obviously a way of improving performance if you have, instead of you know calling um, an operation 15 times, you call it once and get all the data, or what's that about? That's correct, yeah. One of the um, goals in the interface partitioning chapter, and one of the reasons um, it precedes some of the other chapters um, that are more implementation-focused, mm-hmm. is that although we often talk about interfaces, 
it's a common oversight. Uh, developers tend to think first in terms of implementation and structure and second in terms of interfaces. And often when they come to do so, the interfaces are driven by um, – there's a number of systems that have suffered from a, a sort of a naive approach, um, mm-hmm. uh, whether it's not understanding how systems may evolve over time uh, or whether it is just assuming that the techniques they learnt for their local uh, sequential style of programming will will scale sufficiently and quite frankly some of these are just too fine grained the idea that we can have a pure interface and not worry about the context of deployment the context in which that interface is going to be used mm-hmm. uh, the idea that this is an implementation issue um, it's a, it's an optimization issue and should yep. not affect the interface yep. is a is a pleasant little fantasy that some people um, try to live out and a number of methods have also uh, tried to pursue but in reality this is not a question of optimization this is actually a question of making the thing work batch method is um, is, is the practical way uh, of considering this and uh, from that point of view one of the actual opening chapters um, stresses the importance of context with respect to design. And, mm-hmm. uh, what do you a, want to do with this yeah, stuff? A solution, yeah. you know, if you're using a simple iterator in one environment, it's a solution that works in that context. It's sequential, it's happy, it's good, we're all pleased. Uh, it just doesn't work. A straightforward uh, iterator just doesn't scale to a distributed system. Yeah. You have to think a bit harder, and it's not a, it's not a matter of optimization. This is a matter of architecture. Yeah, but it, you do it because you want to make sure some technical concern or Correct. actually works. Yeah. This so is, you, you can't optimize afterwards but yeah. it's a technical concern it's, it's, it's a kind of uh, it, it's kind of optimization or it's a consideration that will affect the very presentation of the interfaces exactly. it's not something that lives inside the, uh, the private section right so in class. this case uh, technical and functional concerns are not orthogonal that's, inter- yeah, they, inter- they, they interact with yes, one another yeah, and that, yes. is, that is part of the challenge indeed yes. it's part of the challenge of uh, trying to come up with the uh, uh, chapter categories but yes, that it works is, yeah. but that is you know, they, 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 some, of the, some of the patterns moved around a little bit during writing because yeah. we sort of said well this, this pattern has two aspects it mm-hmm. can appear here or it can he- appear there yep. and ultimately we felt that uh, dealing with, uh, given that most systems uh, present um, multiple uh, objects and there are very few systems that don't have multiple things of interest then access to these objects and therefore things like iteration and how we uh, gain access to aggregate content matter at the interface level. Therefore, we promoted it to that. Okay, so after discussing the interface level, it's obviously the next step to look at uh, component partitioning and uh, how the implementation can be broken down, right? Yeah, this is the chapter on component partitioning. Uh, within this, we um, take a, a sort of broad brush view. We're not teaching people how to do uh, OO design. That's not the goal. We're mm-hmm. taking a very component-centric uh, view. We, the counterpart to our explicit interface is the yeah. encapsulated implementation. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's the idea that these two creatures are um, uh, not two sides of the same coin. They are not just two sides of the same coin. They can actually be even more loosely coupled. They tell a different story. They mm-hmm. fulfill and drive one another. Um, and again, it was part of this conscious decision to keep them in separate chapters so that they each fell uh, they each had their strong focus and within that we start partitioning and saying okay it's no good to just have a slab of stuff uh, decompose yeah. whole part we talk about um, bringing some of the other classic uh, patterns such as composite, composite. yeah and the, uh, and we talk about other concerns that are actually much coarser than the traditional object uh, consideration, master-slave, um, half-object plus protocol, and replicated component group uh, for dealing with implementation at the broader level. Uh, again, still behind a stable interface. Yeah, master-slave, half-object plus protocol, and replicated component group actually address uh, aspects of distribution and the quality of service like performance, scalability, availability, fault tolerance, so this is people will probably know what master slave is about and what replication is good for. But what is half object plus protocol? Half pro- object plus protocol um, is addressing the fact that if you have only a single component implementation w- deployed to one specific place, you might run into performance problems because if you just access the functionality through a proxy, um, the calls always go over the network. Mm-hmm. And if you now consider a telephone call, um, and um, I'm sitting here in Munich, and uh, my uh, the other party is sitting in, let's say, Hong Kong, uh, where's the call object? Is it in between? Well, um, where to put it? If I have it in some place, and the parties access the object through proxies, we run into performance problems. Um, and the idea is 
that functionality should be as close to the address space where it is used. Mm. And if certain yeah. functionality is only in the used in one address space for what some clients, it should yeah. be there because it can be executed locally. So that would be the one the half network, of the object. It is one half and the network is not used at all. Yeah. Um, like giving me the dial tone doesn't need the other party. Yes. Yeah. Um, likewise, ringing uh, the other party's phone doesn't need me as yeah. a caller so on the other side of the half there can be actually more than two halves, two halves <laughs> in such an arrangement yeah. um, um, there's functionality implemented that is executed locally in the other address space there can be overlaps but the idea is uh, in, in each client's address space uh, implement those functionality that can be executed locally there And a protocol, a kind of peer-to-peer -peer protocol, connects the different halves yep. so that they know one another and form a and semantical unit. Yeah. And whenever a control flow requires um, components in multiple address spaces to cooperate, the network is used. Mm -hmm. Or if state needs to be aligned. Paradox is each network call gets more expensive But the overall performance and mm. throughput is maximized because the more you can execute locally, the less you use the network. Yeah, yeah. And um, that is the, a common technique um, um, for, for improving performance in network systems. And also if you th Smart think of... proxies, right? Right. And also if you think of a conference call... Um, if you have a central implementation yeah. of the call, if yeah. it fails, yeah. the conference is gone. Uh, if you have a half object plus protocol implementation and one half fails, only one party yeah, is lost. What we all know that people drop so out of conference you see, calls it, all This the doesn't time. only address performance, yeah. but also other qualities like yeah. um, fault tolerance or even scalability because with each new party, yeah. with each new address space, you have another half object. So we address yeah. these concerns that deal with distribution uh, and deployment of functionality in that chapter. Just a uh, sort of bring that back to uh, the other key point uh, where we started is that whilst all of this is going on uh, we are maintaining the illusion each uh, each client believes it has the object that is the the key point this is why this lives in component partitioning after this was now component partitioning separating components and their interactions to some extent um, we now look at application control which uh, probably structures the different roles in an application more specifically. So uh, who wants to give it a shot? The application control is actually about... We, we have model view controller. Yeah, and somewhere else, I think. Somewhere else, in another chapter. But how do we control the model? So as you said, you have controllers and the model. Yeah, but how do you do this? And actually, um, Martin Fowler, in his um, Patterns of Enterprise Application... Mm -hmm. Um, he had a whole lot of patterns like page controller, front controller, application controller, uh, different types of views like template view and transform view um, in POSA 1 as command processor that deals with scheduling. So in this chapter, we actually um, collect and describe the key patterns that help you realizing useful controllers and useful views mm -hmm. in terms of uh, presentation and control of application functionality. Um, and that was decorated. That is decorated with some of the security patterns, like authorization, and firewall proxies that play a significant role in distributed applications. Mm -hmm. So it is more or less a summary of the key patterns in Martin Fowler's book and some of the relevant patterns in the security patterns book that help you to access the functionality um, of your application from a remote user interface or remote address yeah, space. So, for example, just to give a, a, a little bit of a flavor what's in there, we'd have the page controller, the way which manages probably web pages or something. Uh, not only uh, web pages, but could also a form-based... Um, oh, yeah, okay. So, it's... Uh, but we are, in this case, we generalize Martin's web-based focus uh, a little because yes. if you have a uh, form-based interv uh, interface that also models a um, workflow right. so it's not just it is not limited to web um, the uh, one of and one of the other aspects in looking at this generalization we're aware that uh, in fact we have it in our example um, the worked example the warehouse story um, 
we can't assume that people are just sitting there looking at app, uh, PCs, looking at web interfaces across the web. This is a very large and important class of distributed systems, but it's certainly not the only one. Yeah, uh, hopefully. Various devices. Um, so it, in looking at form control, uh, we might be driving this from mobile devices. The point is we are trying mm-hmm. to be um, uh, we are trying to capture the essence of a very large class or larger class of distributed mm-hmm. uh, systems than just merely web or just classic object RPC. Yeah, you mentioned um, a workflow. Yeah, a workflow. This is somewhat in application controller. Somewhat, but it's not explicitly. You don't have a no, workflow no. F- style. We don't claim that our language is complete. Okay. So everybody is invited to connect other patterns into the language. That is actually one of the original intentions that we also right. had. That, that we pass the book around. pass the book around and you can add more chapters or new patterns to uh, chapters. You can uh, refactor the existing patterns and, uh, so that they include more reference or dif- references or different references. And definitely the whole area of workflow-based yeah. systems or business rules Process, yeah. um, is not yet covered in the depth that uh, might might be appropriate or useful but if we wouldn't make if we don't make a cut somewhere we would never finish (laughs) and the idea was to this is the first release consider this as a first release an application controller is probably one way into workflow driven control flow Mm -hmm. but it's not the only one and this is an area that uh, may be addressed in a subsequent version. Is there any concrete plans yet to pass it around? Any volunteers yet who said, hey, we're going to add another 200 pages? Uh, you? <laughs> I didn't ask it for that reason. <laughs> no, no we, don't, we don't have concrete plans at okay. this point for doing oh. that. Um, and you'll find that we have obviously have to have an emphasis we although we try to be even-handed and neutral on a number of topics as you say the workflow if you look in application controller is one way in we have state models handled elsewhere within the language mm-hmm. these things can there are many elements within the language that can be combined and of course um, should readers find that they need to deal with a domain or style that is not covered there then poser five will give them the ingredients uh, to rework <laughs> this yeah Okay, next one is, uh, again, looks a bit like POSA 2, concurrency stuff. It is. Uh, so it includes the four concurrency patterns that we have in, uh, in POSA 2, which is half-sync, half-async, leader followers, active object, and monitor object. And it's like uh, we already discussed for the event handling patterns. We yeah. are compressing them, um, showing the key uh, conceptual aspects rather than the details of the implementation, um, and leave it by that. Okay. And then we go to synchronization, which is obviously related to concurrency. And um of course, yes. Um it's it uh, represents potentially the other side. Um in doing so, we have stuck fairly close to the uh, sort of conventional and proven area of synchronizing state change. Yeah, so you don't talk about transactional memory and, and we're not talking about <laughs> transactional memory. We um it we mention we talk briefly about lock free programming, um, yep. but we point out this is very hard and there are a lot of things in terms of memory models that are still maturing out there. Right. But in as much as we are looking at uh, stuff that is lock free, we do highlight a couple of techniques that relate to that. Uh, we include double check locking, although just to make people feel good about this, it has no star rating. Um, we <laughs> include copied value. Why synchronize when you can copy? We include yeah, so immutable that's copy value. on write? Um, that not it's just, it's just, no, it, it, this is actually just, I give you a copy. Oh, um, okay. Uh, it is a snapshot. Um, and this, uh, the notion here is uh, if I deal with copies of data, then clearly there is no scope for synchronization, no need for it. Uh, we yeah. are synchronizing state change. The flip yeah. side of that is immutable value. If there is no state change, there is no need for synchronization. Yeah. And, and, and we've been discussing these things in our various concurrency episodes and also in the interview with Brian Getz and David Holmes. So I think we can maybe skip the rest of this chapter and don't discuss it in okay. much detail. Yeah. And the, the rest of the chapter is, is, uh, is very much on the, the locking side of things, and people will be familiar with patterns from yeah, Doug exactly. Lee's work yeah, yeah, yeah. and uh, from Poser 2. Yeah. Object interaction, the next chapter. Yes, it yeah. is. You have to answer something. Yes, it is. Something. So um, <laughs> what we're looking at here is uh, the interaction, the dialogue between objects. Uh, the um, Or the, components, for that matter. Or is uh, it really objects? objects? We, we are focusing on the objects here. These okay. are, we are within the components. Yeah. Yeah, we okay. are actually looking very much not at the deployment view of things. Um, uh, we are actually looking at the interaction between the runtime objects. So component objects 
to, to uh, differentiate from components. So we are now getting slowly but certainly into the realm of design patterns, golf stuff? The, the traditional uh, design patterns. Indeed, we kick off with Observer, uh, being yeah. a classic interaction one. Yeah. Um, and, of course, in this work, um, uh, careful, careful uh, study will reveal the fact that we have differentiated Observer from Publisher Subscriber. Um, mm-hmm. Which is uh, one is architectural, the other is design. Or? It's not so much that; it's the it's the level at which they, or rather, the significance of the decision in that case, the locality. We are actually saying yeah. that publish subscribe is um, broadly across the network and will involve distribution infrastructure, whereas observer is a much more local, yes. um, a, a local approach. That that's what I meant by architectural yeah. versus okay. design. Um, yeah. We spent a bit of time in Poser 5 um, uh, really talking about these terms, architectural mm-hmm. design in a bit more mm-hmm. detail, but that's not, that's not the focus of Poser 4. So right. we, we look at things like that. We include Observer, Double Dispatch, um, and Mediator, Command. You know, many of these are familiar from the Gang of Four. Memento, importantly, Context Object. What's um, that? Context Object makes its way in here because the idea is that it expresses an execution context. Traditionally, people have um, sort of lent towards using uh, some kind of global or magic access, and they've been very, very clever. Uh, So clever that some systems have uh, suffered the problems of this. We're talking singletons and uh, and Mm. kin. And people end up trying to solve the solution and working around this. The notion of a context object is that from a component point of view, I really do want to isolate my component from external assumptions. I want to do this for reasons of Mm. concurrency, for reasons of security, for reasons of testability. If I pass you the execution context, I... I, the component infrastructure, am telling you what to expect. I can control that. Um, you can work to it. You have a simpler life. Everybody's happy. Yeah. And this is the focus of context object. Um, as a pattern, it's actually been around for a very long time. The earliest I've been able to find is the scheme, uh, uh, the scheme eval function. <laughs> but <Right. laughs> And it actually appears in the Gang of Four book, hiding in the interpreter pattern. Yeah. We talk a little bit more about this in Pairs yeah. of Five. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But as a documented pattern, it's very recent. It, history really only goes back in the last four years. And mm-hmm. been, uh, you know, this is one of these patterns that has been documented and re-documented uh, a number of times in a relatively short space of time. Okay, the next one is, uh, again, on design and implementation level. level um, and it's about adaptation and extension. Yes, so this chapter is more or less about the classic gang of four patterns that deal with adaptation, extension, flexibility. So we have bridged their chain of responsibility, interpreter, visitor, decorator, template method, strategy. And we extended this chapter with a couple of other patterns documented here and there, like like wrapper facade, null object, um, execute around object, um, so, and so on. But nevertheless, um, one specific pattern that we like could discuss here is um, object adapter. Rather than having the classic adapter pattern mm-hmm. of the Gang of Four, we just focused on object adapter. If you read the Gang of Four adapter pattern, it's actually two patterns, yeah. object adapter and class adapter. And so we had a discussion of whether or not to include both or in case we just include one, which one. And we thought that uh, in terms of how we think adaptation in distributed systems could work is it's more the object adapter. You delegate something to yeah. another object yeah. rather than using inheritance uh, to connect the difference, um, you know, that can introduce the uh, fragile base class problem yeah. and uh, inheritance anom- anomalies, which are specifically annoying in distributed systems. Yeah. So you avoid this, and that is why object adapter is included rather than class adapter. And we discussed this issue in POSA 5. You see, um, POSA 4 and POSA 5 are connected yeah. in terms of a couple of things um, that are just implicitly visible in POSA 4. Yeah. And here our um, strategy in, in, in the uh, podcast breaks down a little bit because at the time we broadcast this one, we probably won't have had an episode specifically on the golf design patterns, but we promise... I mean, we expect everybody knows them anyway, but we'll still we still promise that we'll do that at some point. <laughs> okay, anything else on this chapter? 
Um, there are a couple of other contrasts. We talked about object adapter and class adapter, and in this particular case, class adapter didn't make it into the book. But there, there are a couple of others. There's a, a playoff between strategy and template method, for example. We gave strategy two stars and template method one star. We find that the looser coupling mm-hmm. delegation style of strategy is stronger, yep. but we also find template method has uh, has its place within it's more language. more convenient. It's, um, it has yeah. certain convenience. So we, we acknowledge the difference there. Um, likewise, we included um, Interceptor and Decorator, which are sometimes used to solve similar problems. But Interceptor is uh, much less intrusive. It, mm-hmm, uh, it offers mm-hmm. an orthogonal approach to uh, instrumentation. Basically uh, AOP ex- kind yeah, of. Yeah, yeah, it allows you to put extra functional features in whilst keeping the kind of root interface uh, yeah, dealing exactly. with stable. Yeah. Um, but and again, also the additional functionality is independent of the specific interface. Precisely, That's the point. yeah. And, and Decorator, although it's kind of a classic, it's, it's as in some ways, it is not, uh, it was always a favorite teaching example, but in, practi- mm-hmm. in practice, people tend not to use it to be mm-hmm. quite uh, to be quite frank there are many subtleties to it um and object identity for example. object identity being a classic one and uh some methods should not should or should not be propagated mm. um termination being a uh, being a classic example and then if you have to worry about memory management there are further problems oh yeah there. so it still has its role um in terms of you know literally decoration but we felt this was uh, this was fairly low so it, it got no stars there whereas we gave interceptor two stars as it has a very strong proven track record um in component and distributed computing Modal behavior, the next uh, stuff. Yeah, this is a short little chapter. We yep. looked at um, uh, we looked at the space. It's a concern that again, another aspect we spent a little more time talking about in uh, Poser Five. That it's a concern that in the Gang of Four uh, book, uh, there is one pattern that is related to modal behavior, and it is known as the state pattern, mm-hmm. um, which is not used much, or is it? Well, that's the thing. It's uh, not used by some people because of its inherent complexity, but it is overused by others because of its name. Um, in the <laughs> yeah. sense that, oh, this is a state pattern, or it's the state pattern, the therefore state, we go, yeah. we have a state diagram here, we're going to solve the problem that way. Yeah. And it is certainly applicable. Um, we favor using its um, also known as uh, name, objects for states, and we also recognize there are other um, uh, complementary patterns that fit this space, uh, methods for states, Um, do you do there? What's with difference? methods for states, the idea is that we don't so much delegate to a whole object. We mm. don't end up with a, a larger separate class hierarchy. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. All the behavior actually lives in the object of interest. Um, instead, what we have is uh, if we use C++ specific terminology for a moment in the sense of using pointers, uh, what we have there is each state is represented, its behavior is represented by um, uh, effectively nothing more than a struct that has pointers to the right methods for that state. Mm. So all the behavior mm. is not mm. scattered across objects. Yep. We've merely created, if you like, a dynamic V-table approach. Yeah, exactly. yeah, and, uh, and that which is... Which you can't do in Java. So which you, you can't do, yes. This, this is actually one of, the, um, one of the key things is when, I, when this pattern was originally documented, um, the shepherd proposed that I should present a a, a Java example, and I said, but mm. Java <laughs> is not the right language to do this in. Yes. There are a number of problems, but you should you don't do have that. method pointers. Basically. Yeah, exactly. I said because uh, Java is not an object-oriented language, in spite What? of rumor to the contrary. Oh, well, that's a separate episode. But that is a separate we don't episode. Don't go into this now. <laughs> <laughs> um, And so it's a very context-specific one. So we find this is relevant in languages like C++. We find it is relevant in languages like C Sharp. And dynamically typed languages, it is immediately relevant. Or in because, Scala. And uh, I presume you have an episode on that. Not that's yet. A, not yet. We're okay, that's a different one. <laughs> so methods for states in that sense offers a more appropriate one. And again, this brings back the context specificity of design. Um, we wrap up the chapter with collections for states, which deals about co- collectively treating objects in similar right. states. Putting ex- in, this, in a separate collection. Yeah, it's yeah. an extrinsic state model rather yes, than an exa- intrinsic one. Yeah, good distinction. Next one, resource management. Frank? Yeah, resource management is actually the largest chapter in the entire book, right. which is um, not only for the reason that there's an entire POSA volume, POSA 3, on which the subject. Which we also already talked about on the podcast. But we discovered, in the end, I, I, I wondered why this is the biggest chapter. It has more patterns in it than there are in POSA the 3. Book, yeah. I see container uh, from uh, server right. component it's patterns. Also, yeah. It's yeah. also a resource management pattern. Uh, components are also resources yeah. that need to be managed. Uh, and we discovered that resource management is a key issue in building yeah. um, usable distributed systems that resources are limited, even in a distributed system. 
Um, and therefore, things like containers, like how to find uh, components, Look up. how to configure um, components, how to manage resources, how to create components, how to delete them, um, and things like that are of significant importance. Yeah. So, so it addresses all the resource management and life cycle and lifetime patterns that we know. It's even um, can, containing some of the Gang of Four patterns like Abstract Factory and Builder. Yeah, they it's also a deal way to create resources. Yeah. yeah. So there is somewhat that it's somewhat no surprise that this chapter is the largest because mm-hmm. at the bottom of the system you deal with the resources, resources yes. and uh, resource management is everything in a distributed system. It is interesting that when we actually tried to divide yeah. the um, divide up this chapter in different ways, we found that the coupling between the parts was far too strong. Um, then uh, eventually we settled for very careful ordering, a very careful sequence of disclosure within the uh, chapter, uh, f- which benefits the reader as well as the authors um, in terms of dealing with all of these issues. So um, um, just to... to, to connect um there are things like lazy acquisition resource pooling uh evict- evictor activator so these are all different ways of handling not just the creation of res- re- resources but specifically also their deletion which is arguably the the bigger challenge in practice and not just the deletion the entire life cycle activator is somewhat in between right. yeah. so we, we start from the creation and then have different um, intermediate states, such as resource cache, for instance. Um, you don't delete the objects. They right, yeah, live yeah. for yeah. a while, and if they're reaccessed, um, then they're returned to some client. So it's the entire life cycle that we address. Our leasing is also mm-hmm. m- more right. about life cycle than about pure deletion. Right. Ex- ex- yeah. Somebody acquires a resource and releases it, and then what happens? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So... It's more than just object life time. It's mm-hmm. life cycle. Right. Uh-huh. Which explains one of the uh, reasons why we did find it very difficult to separate this because the activation, reactivation, acquisition, and so on, all of these concerns ultimately grow from um, the fact that uh, in the past people have focused on creational patterns, which is a nice starting point. Mm-hmm. But the minute you start hitting uh, large-scale systems and distributing them, um, the creation is only uh, is the, it is just, just one hand, and the sound of one hand clapping is really not very much unless you hit somebody. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that's that's really the reason that uh, the chapter expanded because this is a fundamental uh, fundamental issue, and we wanted to offer readers a, a sufficient appreciation of what was out there. Mm-hmm. The final chapter of the language itself is database access. I'm somewhat surprised that it's in the book. Well, many distributed systems um, somehow use a database. Yeah, but you yeah yeah you're obviously right. But somehow for me it feels somewhat different. I don't think so. I find it it's a um, important chapter, but on the other hand, we don't go into too much depth here. Yeah, it's also proxy patterns. Basically, basically there are the four key database access patterns from Martin Fowler's uh, Patterns of Enterprise Application. Yep. But interestingly, um, we start with another pattern that is not described in Martin's book, which is database access layer. Mm-hmm. That goes back to work from Jens Koldewey and Wolfgang Keller, mm-hmm. who also um, and also from um, um, Kyle Brown and Bruce mm-hmm. Wetneck. Um, and they started off their database um, patterns, so accessing a relational or object relational database from an object oriented system um, by introducing a database access layer. Uh, Martin didn't address this, but, but we thought where are all these row data gateways, table data gateways, active records would live? Mm-hmm. Scattered through the system? Mm-hmm. Or collected in a single place, and that is why we introduced database access layer and moved on from there. But it's basically a chapter into um, into the many patterns on object relational yeah. data mapping. <laughs> the whole world. So, but we find it important. But if you look at um, uh, patterns that we have, like shared repository and Blackboard, mm-hmm. and so there are some. Yeah, there's data often for, implemented with databases. Yes. Yeah. So we need a connection, right? Mm-hmm. To reinforce that, you can actually see um, database access layer follows from layers. It follows from shared repository, mm-hmm. and. 
uh, to go back to uh, why weren't uh, to, to surprise? Why weren't you surprised when we included patterns that dealt with views? Um, you know, many applications have some user interface. Exactly. And, yeah. And the point is that if we're going to deal with views, which many people see as the top side of a system, um, we are also going to deal with the bottom side, which or to be database, more yeah. accurate, the the outside. A database is a yep. different kind of presentation layer. It is it is uh, in the mm. sense of it is it represents a form of interaction and I/O. It represents a world of its own and so our point was without this the language cannot be fully considered complete uh, but it's not going to we're not going to give it the same emphasis as perhaps resource management which we did in the previous yeah. chapter yeah. okay since we are also running out of time and also the book is more or less we went through it um, let's um, wrap up this episode the last chapter is called a departing thought which is a good like headline for this maybe your last words on this episode on this podcast here Yeah, well, the departing thought in, in, in the Posa 4 is basically... Um, read Posa 5. <laughs> read Posa 5. It, it's just a transition towards Posa 5. Yes. Posa 4 doesn't include the typical um, um, closure that other Posa volumes have, like um, uh, past, present, and future yeah, and yeah. things, because Posa 5 does this. Yeah. Um, it includes that chapter. So because they are... They were written more or less simultaneously and they will be published more or less simultaneously. Um, Posa 4 has a very short ending saying, okay, this is it, and see yep. you at Posa 5. Yep. Um, and, um, yeah, have fun developing distributed systems. That is basically what he's saying. Yeah. yeah, cool. So thank you both for being on the podcast. Thank you very much for interviewing us. Thank you. Thanks for listening to Software Engineering Radio. If you want to get more information about Software Engineering Radio or if you want to give us feedback, please go to our website at se-radio.net. You can also contact the team at team at se-radio.net, although we prefer entries in our comments system on the website so other people can see what you think. Software Engineering Radio wants to thank Henning Pauli for the intro and outro music, as well as Lipson for providing the bandwidth. This episode of SE Radio, as well as all other episodes, is licensed under Creative Commons license. See the Software Engineering Radio website for details.